Um, I'm feeling very much like she's a kindred spirit, if I'm being totally honest. Like, oh, maybe in another life, and if I was if I was slightly more radical in my political views, I, I just, wow. Social Studies special episode, Emily Learns About Emma Goldman, part two. We're here with Rudy Ramirez. Welcome. Oh my gosh, I can't wait. Um, I want to know, so Emma Goldman is working in her ice cream shop with her two lovers that are cousins. Uh, she has sort of moved away from the um, kind of radical anarchist like movement that was trying to kind of control her as a speaker and now she's trying to like do her own thing and when we left they were plotting to assassinate a like robber baron captive captain of industry yes oh my exactly. gosh what uh, happens so, okay so um carnegie steel of course sure. is is doing its thing um in the late like uh 19th century and uh so in 1892 you have the homestead strike yes and you know you have like the conflict between like the Pinkertons and the Strikers. I just realized oh. I now know who Frick is. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I just realized yeah, I'm yeah. like, oh right. Okay. So can I tell you who I think he is, and you can tell me if I'm wrong? Hit it. Okay. So in <laughs> okay now I'm nervous. So in the Homestead strike, Carnegie's men were striking at the steel plant, and then uh, Carnegie's people. And my understanding is Frick is like his guy. Yeah. So Frick is really the one like running this. If I am understanding this right, Carnegie might even be like in Scotland. So Frick is really the guy running the day to day. And so he hires Pinkerton agents, which are, I guess, like hired kind of police. Yeah. Sort of. And detectives. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're, they're kind of, and they were, they were strike breakers for the most part. Right. To come in and break the strike, and there's actually like a battle, right? Like the workers actually surround the plant, and there's a battle between these like strike break breakers hired by Frick and the striking workers. And I can't remember what the result of that was in terms of like deaths. Like, um, I mean, there were there were there were deaths on both sides okay. from what I from what I remember. But like, so in terms of how it turns out, uh, this is this is where uh, Emma and Sasha come in. All okay. Right? They, at the time, um, you know, they thought to themselves, like, all right, so we're trying to instigate a revolution. Maybe the way to do that is by killing Henry Clay Frick, um, who has instigated so much of this violence, mm -hmm. all right? Is this um, during the Homestead strike, or this is... This is after the the the, the battle. Okay. After the violence mm -hmm. happened, all right? Um, and it's it's so... And like so, the, the the nation is starting to turn against Frick and turn against like Carnegie Steel at the moment. So it's, they're like, "Well, to, to take advantage of this, we'll go there." And so Sasha goes there. Emma, in the meantime, she's like, she has to raise money for him, and so she she very famously uh, decides, like, for one night, she's like, "All right," she decides, like, "I'm gonna I'm gonna be a prostitute, and I'm gonna like raise money as a sex worker." <gasps> um, and she goes out there that night and like, and this guy picks her up and he's just like, you're not a sex worker. Um, you should maybe not do this. <laughs> and so, so that was her one horribly failed attempt at trying to Oh, so sex. she doesn't go through with it? Like there's a guy that's just like, oh, don't know. Yeah, yeah like the guy's like, mm, no, like I could tell. Just, oh, who is tell. this guy? I want to know him. I don't know. Like so she, ever, she never got his name. Um, oh, good for him. Thanks, dude. And, uh, right and so um so sasha goes and gets into henry Frick's office and he shoots but he doesn't actually kill frick oh. um and he gets taken and arrested but the assassination attempt totally backfires yeah. and suddenly everybody's like more afraid of the anarchists and protesters than they are of frick and the capital right so this is a complete disaster yeah and it kind of seems like it goes along with you know we in this this narrative in our u.s history is that there are um kind of state sanctioned forms of violence right like that and it's like there you know no one would say violence is good but then there are types of violence that we just think like well that's just the way the world works sometimes police right. have to use violence which is true i guess and sometimes they have to blah 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 and it seems like if you're 
if you're part of the establishment, there's a lot of, there's violence that gets just sort of like, well, that's just the way the world is. But then when people use violence to try to end those systems, it's when they're from the outside, it's like, no, you, this is why we can't have nice things. Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. This event that's aftermath really changed Emma Goldman's take on like she didn't she, she never denounced violence entirely as a means of revolution but she very much realized like we, that 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 grand gestures of violence don't work yeah and and, um, and so which comes in later on when McKinley gets involved oh no um, and so uh, so Sasha is sent to prison for like 30 years Ooh. Um, but she keeps going yeah. in the movement um and uh and she's not arrested for this for involvement in it um and then comes my favorite emma goldman speech of all time okay union square 1893 she says why are we having this protest here when we should be having it on fifth avenue where all the wealthy people live mm. and she says demonstrate before the palaces of the rich Demand work. If they do not give you work, demand bread. If they do not give you bread, take bread. Ooh. Uh, yeah. I love I love that for a few reasons. I love it because you can tell you can tell Emma Goldman is incredibly smart, and you can tell that she's learning from her experiences, right? Like she's learning of okay, I'm first gonna do what this guy tells me and just say. We need to totally ignore kind of the socialist labor movement and just go for full anarchy. And then she hears people. She hears people saying, well, that's fine, but that's not going to help me. And so then she sort of changes her, like she's learning, right? I think some people today might say like, she's a flip flopper or whatever, but it's like, she's clearly just evolving. And yeah. that speech is very pragmatic, right? It's like, ask for the thing that you really want, which is work. And that's, that's a thing that then you can be a productive member of this society but then backup plan, okay, fine. If you're not going to be work, then just at least make sure I can live, right? And I think it's also important to contextualize like the turn of the century and how bad it was and how hard it was to live, like to exist and to survive. I think that that's something that it's hard for us to picture now because we're like post-progressive era, post-New Deal, these things that created sort of safety nets. And so she's really, she's part of the movement to, to create those things. So the late 1800s, right? If you've seen like Newsies, which I've seen a million times, or if you've <laughs> any sort of anything like that, I mean, it's, you are sometimes living on the streets and there's no protection for you. There's no, there's no guarantee that you should have food. There's no guarantee of even if you are working of what you should be paid. And if your arm gets chopped off in a machine, then you just lose your job. So I think it's really important too, that like, it was, I mean, it was, it was dark. It was sort of medieval to, to some extent in the Gilded yeah. Age. And there was yeah. such inequality that like that speech is badass. And it's, it's so badass. And like, it's so like, I mean, you know, this was, you know, this was a time that it was like a 20% unemployment rate. Like, and so, so this is all these people who are starving. Yeah. Um, so she gets arrested for inciting to run it. She says, as she's being arrested, she's basically telling the people, be just like, make sure that for my the speech I was supposed to give tomorrow night, get a good speaker and get a woman. Like, oh. it's just like, make sure it's a woman. God, I love um, that. Okay. And they get this woman named Voltaire Declare. Emma says, like, she would have been, she was more eloquent than I was. She's a better writer than I was. Um, and she would have been a bigger speaker except that she had chronic pain so like it's like you get this sort of like disability rights narrative also happening whoa so emma goldman goes to jail mm -hmm. um she's there for like a while um but she she you know she doesn't waste any time ever and she um she winds up becoming this into the doctor in the jail and she learns all these nursing skills and so when she leaves she becomes like a trained nurse midwife and massage therapist what? But, yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. She's a Renaissance woman. Yeah. Yeah. She's doing all these things. All right. You know, she's out of jail. She's, she's doing her thing. She's at this speech and this like guy comes up to her and he's, he's, very, he's acting very weird. All right. And he's like, do you have any books to recommend? And she's like, okay, these books, blah, 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 blah. 
and she and this guy keeps coming around like the anarchist meetings and being just really weird and and so she starts thinking is he like an agent provocateur or something yeah like, he, like or a spy of some kind hmm. so she goes to visit her sister helena who's like the best friend and like they get to like hang out and um and you know she sees like the kids so, like that her nieces and nephews who close the doors and then on the train back, she hears that McKinley has been shot. Then she sees the picture of the assassin, Leon Chalgosh. Right. And she's like, it's that guy. It's that young kid who was acting so weird. Whoa. And then... The story gets out that Leon Cholgosh, the assassin of Willie McKinley, says, I was inspired after hearing Emma Goldman speak. Oh, come on, dude. Don't throw other people under the bus. <laughs> <laughs> like, right? And so she winds up, like, hiding out. Um, <laughs> at one point, like, this happened. Like, at least she says it in her autobiography. The, the cops come and they, like, go to the place where she is. And she pretends to be the Swedish maid, like, of the house that she's living in. And is like, oh, yes, Emma Goldman is not here. I do not know who that is. Like, Why is um, there not a movie of her life? Like, her movie, I, there are, like, scenes. I, I mean, it just, it writes itself. It really does. It really does. Oh, my gosh. And so just so to be good. clear, like, even if she had inspired this guy, I mean, she still didn't commit a crime, right? Right, right. Okay. So that's that's the thing is that so what happens is they like eventually they, they figure out who she is. And she I think well, one was just like like she's like I can't do this anymore. Like it's, it's me. I'm memorable. <laughs> I'm exhausted. Uh, just whatever. This is dumb. Um, so she gets arrested and she gets detained. And Clarence freaking Darrow's like assistant goes to be like Emma. We're willing to defend you oh. in this situation. Clarence um, Darrow. Whoa, yeah. there's like a lot of different people in this story I wasn't expecting. Clarence Darrow is going to become, or he maybe at that point already is like one of the most famous lawyers of yeah. the day. I know yeah. him. He becomes famous for arguing against uh, William Jennings Bryan in the Scopes monkey yeah. trial. Right. Yeah. He sort of puts the Bible, he puts the Bible in the stand and is like, is this literal? And it's this really huge kind of moment in, le in, in the history of like teaching evolution yeah. and that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Daryl, like, I mean, he was really famous for doing, like, a lot. Like, he was very, one very, like, anti-death penalty. So he would take a lot of, like, really prominent lost cause cases. Mm. And they said, he'll take your case, but you have to denounce Leon Chalgosh. Mm. And she says, nah. Uh, she says, look. I am not here to judge what another person thinks is necessary for revolution. Whoa. And she says, I've learned in my life that this is not wise, but I don't know what he was thinking. She, she calls him a, like a super sensitive, like Sasha was. Um, wow. That's so like evolved. And I mean, she seems truly sincere I love this story already because again, and I'm, I don't, I'm not an anarchist, but like, I think we have this idea of what an anarchist is. And it's, it's the same thing we sometimes have of like, when I talk to students about like, what does it mean to be an atheist? And people think it's like, you worship Satan and you dance around a fire naked. And it's like, no, it's actually something kind of rational and you just might disagree with it. And same with anarchism. It's like, you know, it sounds like Jean-Jacques Rousseau, one of our enlightened heroes, yeah. was an anarchist, right? And I, I think that, like, someone like Emma Goldman is should be the face of anarchism, whereas instead someone like this Leon, whatever his last name is, guy becomes oh, the face of it, of, like, this sort of just young, wayward soul who then decides to shoot the president, right? Yeah, and I mean, and that's the thing. It's like, you know, there's, I mean... No one, no one who chooses to assassinate a president, I think, is fully um, in their right mind. But like, so she's refusing to denounce him, and they keep telling her, like, "Oh, well, he's, you know, he said that you did this, and that you, you were the plot of the, you know, the brains behind the operation." Oh, and she's like, 
no. Like, she's like, I don't, I'm not going to denounce him. I don't like, <clears throat> but the truth is his entire time, he just doesn't say like, she inspired me, but she was in no way involved. She was in no way actually. Involved. Oh, so they're just trying to trick her into being like, he's trying to screw you over. You need to turn against him. Yep. Whoa. Yeah. And the two anarchists yeah. have a better sense yeah. of like ethics and, <laughs> and they're like, yep. no, I'm going to be honest. And whoa. Yeah. Yeah. When Emma Goldman was released, you know, she said, she was like, I'm in like McKinley. He didn't die immediately from his wounds. So she's like, I'm a trained nurse and I will go today and nurse McKinley right, right now. Like I will, because right now he's a man, like he's a human being, mm. like, but when he was president, he was the head of the state. Wow. And as an anarchist, I stand against the state, but I don't stand against the person. Um, wow. Yeah. yeah. So, and Mc, I mean, cause McKinley, my understanding, I mean, McKinley wasn't, dramatically worse or better than other presidents during the Gilded Age, right? So it doesn't seem like, the, it's not like the issues with McKinley necessarily, it's with all right. of them. It's just whoever's in the office. Yeah, and so, um, so Chalgosh, you know, goes to the chair, never once denouncing Emma Goldman, hmm. but, you know, at that point, like, you know, her notoriety just goes through the roof mm -hmm. um which is of course at this point where she's just like you know what why don't i start my own anarchist newsletter uh <laughs> i was just gonna say i was like emma goldman today would have a podcast she would have a podcast yes. today because it sounds yes. like she's like like you're saying she's very charming and she people like to talk to her they get inspired by her well like the thing that i think the reason why i really dwell on her reaction to tall gosh what is that she was this pure idealist yeah you know, and, and she never wavered in her ideals. She didn't always get it right, you know? Yeah. And like, there's definitely, like, a lot of things that I, I can talk about in terms of, um, especially, like, she, the, the thing that she never understood, and she even admitted to not understanding it, but I think that she really dropped the ball on was race in America. Mm -hmm. To what extent was the anarchist movement, I mean, when I hear most of the names, they sound Eastern European, they sound like they're all coming from at least similar parts of the world. Is that true based on what you know? Like, is there an extent of, even if it's, uh, obviously race plays a role, but even just feeling like they're not one of us for many other reasons too? I would say that there were a lot of, of German, a lot of uh, Eastern European anarchists, but they weren't exclusive. See, and I think, I think it's an important point too, that like, that's a, the race issue is a mistake that like so many progressive reformers made in that, again, it's, it's like what we've sort of been talking about, about do you go full throttle for purely what you think would be best or do you go for what you think will like sell and what you think more people will accept and what a lot of progressive reformers, they had to say, even like in the feminist movement too, in the suffrage movement, right? They had to say, well, if we include, now a lot of those women were just racist, right? But there's also this element of like, well, that would be too radical to also include black women in our movement. That's going to turn away a lot of moderate white men who might otherwise be like, well, sure, I guess my white wife can vote, right? And so a lot of people do that where there's, there's so many layers to it. There's outright racism that's clear, but then there's also people working within the racist system <laughs> And saying, well, I acknowledge this systemic racism is here, and so I don't want it. I don't want another race in my movement because it's going to hold my movement back, which is problematic too. So who knows why she did that? But it's like, yeah, it's a bummer. Now knowing Emma as somebody who, you know, like, so she she starts publishing Mother Earth, all right, which is the name of her um, anarchist journal. And she hears about the trial of Oscar Wilde. Okay. Um, and so. Emma, in addition to being everything else, Emma was a theater critic. Oh my god! Uh, <laughs> um, Just in her like spare she, time. Yeah, yeah. So, like, so, so, as she's writing, she's editing this magazine, she's like publishing, like her writing, writing by like other people in the movement, people in the other women in the movement. You know, like she, uh, but she loves theater, and she also loved like Wilde's writing, and was so horrified when. He was put on trial for um, for gross indecency, you know, basically being like he was he was having affairs with men. Yeah. Um, 
and he was sentenced to three years of hard labor. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which a few years ago, it would have been a death sentence. Um, wow. Yeah, that's progressive. <laughs> at the, yeah, wow. And Oscar Wilde, that's in the United States? Oscar Wilde is in the UK. Yeah. Hmm. So he, and he serves three years hard labor? Yeah, Oscar Wilde serves three years hard labor, and it really broke him. Um, yeah. It was really, um, really tragic. So Emma decides, all right, like she is going to fight. She's going to publish articles in the U.S., um, supporting Oscar Wilde and supporting gay rights in like 1906. Whoa. You know, the, a lot of anarchists were just like, Emma, like people already think we're perverts. Right. People already think we're sinners. You can't publish an article in favor of like arguing in favor of rights for gay people, rights yeah. for homosexuals. And she, again, she's just like, do do you not see anarchism on the label? Like, yeah. and do you not like? Also, I publish this. I do what I want. Um, yeah. And 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 so she did. And so and and there's a lot of there's a lot of question whether Emma Goldman herself was queer. Um, she never talked about it in her memoir. And I feel like Emma's the kind of person who would just say it. Would. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so she publishes, I'm assuming, she publishes her articles in defense of Oscar Wilde. Go, and also this is like around the time that um, we're getting close to the time when like Sasha Berkman gets released from jail. Oh, and this is yeah. her sort of like um, soulmate if she has one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Sasha comes back into her life. Um, but he is, I mean, you know, he was in jail for, for decades and is just, you know, very broken. Um, they, 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 they never continue their romantic relationship, but mm. they continue their friendship and basically just like, it's, it's like an old married couple. They hang out together all the time. Yeah. Cause does she ever get remarried? Um, for citizenship purposes, oh. like way later on. Oh, but that's okay. after she gets deported to Russia right after the Russian revolution. <gasps> oh okay wait so is that is that where we're heading next so she's yeah. so she okay so we started off she's just like running her ice cream shop i'm still obsessed with that fact and yep. then you have they try to assassinate frick it doesn't work but sasha ends up in prison mm -hmm. then she's just kind of speaking she's on the circuit she supposedly inspires the assassination of mckinley yep. and so she is now notorious Yep. And she's just like, screw it. If I'm notorious, I might as well argue for gay rights. Control was another big one. Yeah, so she, I was going to say, she's probably around with, like, a lot of people don't realize, like, Margaret Sanger is the one who founds Planned Parenthood in Brooklyn in, like, the, I think, 1914 yep. or something. I mean, it's... They, they worked together. Oh, they did? Okay. I was going to say, I was like, they would be friends, I feel like. So, um, okay, so she's getting involved in just, she's really, like, translating her belief in basic human rights and anarchism to kind of almost all aspects of society except for the issue of race which is unfortunate but yep. also is not unique to that time period right. okay right. and now we're waiting sasha's gonna come sasha's gonna be released from prison sasha's released and things are gonna escalate is what i'm sensing yeah there's a little thing called world war one happened <gasps> i forgot about world war one okay all right so we're gonna that's we're gonna pause there on this la yeah. this other cliffhanger and then when we come back for our third installment, we're going to talk about the war. Spoiler alert, uh, a war is not great for anarchists. <laughs> nope. Yeah. Having said that, it was pretty good for people doing that in Russia, now that when you think about it. That's true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Unless you're willing to really commit like they were exactly. in Russia. All right. Go for it. I can't wait. Okay. Yeah. To be yeah. continued.